Right, so we have uh, decided that basically we would um, start creating some degree of at least a basic introduction to D&D &D and such and actually recording it this time. So um, yeah, basically we've created a list of all these different stuff we want to talk about and we'll flick through it. Um, if anyone in the chat drops a message or something, we are always able to access that and answer those questions. I'm joined here with Mastermind, of course. Uh, hello. Hello. Um, so, you uh, obviously, you know, you've DM'd for quite a while, as have I. I would like to think. I'm guessing you've actually probably been DMing longer than I have, because my first... Uh, What's up? If, if so, only slightly longer. Okay, fair. Because, yeah, my first time was on May 18th, um, so about three years ago at this point, give or take. Um, yeah, so maybe... Uh, maybe six to twelve months longer than you then. That's fair, yeah. So, regardless, we both, to my knowledge, have started with 5th uh, edition, so we can't speak uh, to anything past that, I'm presuming. Well, I technically, the first game I played was 3.5, but oh. first game I DM'd was 5th. Okay, that's fair. But yeah, so, so that's at least laying down the groundwork of our knowledge. Yeah, that's um, where most of my experience is as well. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but yeah, and then so of course, uh, we've been roughly in the same D&D kind of group, like broader group for the most part anyways. And yeah. that's at least the background of what we've been able to do in terms of collaboration. Um, I'll quickly drop the note that um, just on the background of, um, of this video itself, you can see a map that we've been kind of designing on stream. So um, feel free to... Um, swing around if uh, you're watching the video or if you're watching the VOD for some reason instead of just going to the YouTube at exclamation mark YouTube that you can find. Uh, subtle, not so subtle plugs. Um, that being said, also check out Mastermind72727 on Twitch. Uh, I'm unsure of whether you've got a YouTube. I presume you do, but I don't think uh, you upload to it. I do. I have a YouTube, but it's not it's not D D related. That's it's fair. It's more music related. That's understandable. I mean, um, it's still the Mastermind Seven Two Seven. Okay, that's um, fair. At YouTube, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's fair. Um, but yeah, I suppose uh, let's get into it. Um, so, at least this, and I'll give the disclaimer that this is at least personally what I do. Mastermind, you might have a bit of a different, um, a yeah, different I think we have list of stuff. slightly different play styles or DM styles, which. Mm. I think is actually a good thing when it comes to advice. Definitely, and a couple, uh, couple of different perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, there's quite a few different DM styles in general. I would say you probably are more along the lines of, um, like actually, uh, making a world and kind of keeping it separate from the players in terms of like the world is going to keep moving even if the players don't do certain stuff. Um, uh, to some degree, yeah, I agree. Um, like, I'm not going to make it so everything happens whether the players are there or not, but if but, the players yeah. miss something, then they miss it. That's it's not going to wait. Yeah, whereas I'm more in the style of, I'm, at least in personally, and I'll, I'll point this back over to the fact that I haven't actually played traditional, or rather I haven't DM'd traditional D&D for quite a lot while, at least in terms of proper D and D of a continuing session. Um, we've had several one shot type things, but my main sort of knowledge comes from custom building an entire kind of D and D esque D twenty based role playing system of my own, based on D and D and my knowledge of that. But that being said, I have I do think I've played enough D and D to kind of have an understanding of yeah. certain things like that. Um, and whilst I like homebrew and stuff like that i tend to stick to the standard um fifth edition because most of the time when i'm starting a campaign i'm starting with new players or that's players fair. who haven't started who haven't yeah. played before that, that's entirely fair and frankly um at speaking of we've got an, an entire session starting in what three days i believe it is of um introducing a couple new people to D&D that um, I believe they've played one session before but it's but this is going to be if it continues into a proper thing it's going to be their main first um, campaign that they've played 
So that's going to be interesting, to say the least. But I'm not particularly shy when it comes to teaching people D&D, so, and I presume you're not either, so we should be right. Um. But um, that brings us at least to the first kind of situation, our first note that we have here in terms of creating the broad world. And now, I don't particularly know if this is something that you necessarily do, but personally, in my experience as a DM, my first thing that I do is going out of my way to have a rough idea of what I want the story and what I want the actual campaign to be about. And this also does come to the whole rebuilding D&D style thing. Um, I had a show yeah. that I was really into for quite a while. Mastermind, you of course know of this, um, Hero Academia. I really enjoyed the superhero aspect of it, and so I took a lot of inspiration and essentially created a world that based around that. Um, people had superpowers, all that sort of stuff. And that was at least the main nail in the co- or ma- main nail on the table that kept us on the same page. And even with people playing who had both seen the show and hadn't, having established that concept at the start, I believe gave it a level of you know stability that um, I think if I hadn't at least established that and had just said, "Oh, we're playing superheroes." Um, think of a power it didn't really it wouldn't have gone over as well yeah that's probably something we'll touch on uh, over the course of this but it's very important to make sure everyone understands exactly what's going on what's the theme um, what are what are the rules what are the do's and don'ts of the that particular campaign yeah that's absolutely true um, I mean after all you don't want someone rolling up to their first session where you're playing medieval fantasy saying, oh yeah, so um, I've made sure to equip my character. He's a, he's a space ranger. He's got, um, he's got several uh, neon blasters and um, at- atomic grenades sort of thing. You don't want that because... Yeah, that's... Yeah, that would uh, not go over really well. Nice. That would be one of those sort of situations where I would straight up say to them, hey, do you know what campaign you're playing in? No? Okay, well... Put whatever you've got in the trash. Let's rebuild from session one. Unfortunately, that's also a slight bit disruptive for the people who do know what what's happening. But yeah. if but the key is also that I'll point out is, as the DM, you need to ensure that everyone's on the same page as that. Um, it's one of those situations where, at the same time, you can't blame a player for rocking up with something like that if they've been told, "Hey, we're playing a space space opera or whatever." But if you say yeah. fantasy and they bring that in, that's when it's their issue. If it's, you know, not if it's not properly told to them, and then, of course, that becomes a communication issue that needs to be resolved. But yes, um, I don't actually think we've ever had an instance, luckily, of someone rocking up like that saying, "Oh yeah, I've got my stuff prepared," but it's actually for a completely different situation. Um, I don't. I don't think I've experienced that either. Yeah. Um, but that, that comes down to good practice as the DM of ensuring that before you ever ses- have a session zero, uh, everyone knows exactly what to expect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, ultimately, it um, that, that being said as well, um, there is also something to be said about the fact that fantasy D&D, that traditional sort of style that we always tend to go to, it's it's hard to kind of get lost when you're looking at that sort of thing. Like everyone knows, oh yes, fantasy. So, you know, crossbows, lances, you know, all that sort of good stuff. Yeah, medieval style. Um, period. Yeah, it's very common and thankfully very easy to work with. Um, now the next point I've got here is something that I don't know necessarily how much you're familiar with it, uh, Mastermind, but it's something that personally. I've experienced quite a lot in my whole custom-built game of... I was very bad at the start. There was a lot of sessions that went by where, you know, you see on YouTube all these people being like, oh, these are the things that you should not do. You should never split the party. You should never make player versus player combat a DM enforced... or not enforced, but DM, you know, provided thing, or etc., etc., right? You should always, like, make sure that, to some degree... 
it's entirely the de- the character's choice on what they want to do. You don't railroad them, all that sort of thing. But just as seeing that and understanding that, I think having been through it and having experienced it as a DM and as someone who has thrown stuff out and it hasn't stuck to the wall, that's an important thing as well, where I've had to talk to my players and say, hey, I get... Personally, at least for me, this session wasn't the most enjoyable. What do you think? And we'll get to it later in terms of who you're playing with. But as long as you've got players who are relatively friendly and cool, they'll just say, hey, yeah, I, I kind of didn't enjoy that session either. You know, it was because of this thing. It might have been because of that thing, etc. And just having that open line of communication between the DM and the player is extremely important. Yeah, with with just like anything it's a it's a skill it's combining uh improvisation public speaking uh and such like this there's uh can be often a bit of stress with dming which makes you prone to making mistakes or uh doing things uh in a way that you end up not happy with but um from that it's very much a learning that this doesn't work, so we won't do this again. Um, and then talking with your players, uh, and quite often, a lot of the mistakes you, you think you'll have made, uh, provided they're not massive ones, the players won't even have noticed. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely true as well. Because to a lot of players, like if they are, if they have the impression that you have an overarching story that's good, even if you haven't gone too hard into implying that to them even just that idea that they think you do can be really useful um for a lot of the first part of my um my hero campaign i started it with roughly sticking to the story of the actual show hero academia but as we started moving on it put me into a position of i don't want to just be copying the show because I'm not really into that idea of directly copying, but as we moved away from it, I started listening to what my players pointed out in terms of the things that I improvised. So for example, they might have been walking through an old abandoned factory and they come into the start or the first uh, foyer room um, and on the ground in a pile of rubble they see And as I'm just kind of scanning through my mind of different things that they could find, oh, you find a a wristwatch. It's sitting on the ground. It's a bit broken, but um, but the time seems to be stuck on a singular um, a singular like specific time. It is the arm is still attempting to flick over onto the next second, but it just seems to be stuck. And then later on, we return back to that place in what was essentially supposed to be a dream world. Think um, Pokemon Platinum, um, you know, that sort of um, reverse world, I believe it was called, or something like that. And they came back to this location, and one of my players who is one of my, like, one of my close friends from high school, he came into the room and he said to me, he's like, is the watch still here? And so I gave it a second of thought and I said, Yes, the watch is still here, and it's still sitting on the same time that it was before. And from that, he picked it up, and that started leading them into, essentially, this whole kind of time-based set of stories where someone who had an ability to control time, essentially, had, like, been chased over all of these different places, and without without having my friend mention it, we would have gone in a completely different direction for the entirety of the story and it wouldn't have been as successful. I've gone on a tangent, but my whole point is essentially listen to your players, understand that improvising is good, and it's even better when it's done with your friends. Yeah, and that's another thing. Improvising is is very difficult. Not only improvising a story, but also improvising interactions and stuff. It is, however, something that uh, you can, to some degree, fumble your way through and still be successful at. 
Absolutely, um, especially if it's if you're talking in terms of creating an NPC, which comes later, of course, in the list of notes that we have here. But an NPC isn't robotic. It's not perfect. An NPC is supposed to be a portrayal of a character who might even dislike the players. They might have, depending on the situation and who exactly you're playing, the NPC could be actively against the players. And that's something that can be used to your advantage and to relieve some stress of trying to play that NPC. You know, if you've got someone who... Like, if you've got a party who had to go and assassinate someone, and then you come back and you realise, oh man, the person we assassinated, his daughter is actually the tavern keeper. Then the tavern keeper, it, well, for one, immediately is going to be implied to have quite a lot of negative feelings towards the party and at that point may even just fully refuse service or send, you know, a, a hit squad after them. And, of course, you know, they don't have to say that straight-faced. You know, you could have a character who's, you know, so mentally wrecked where they can barely, like, you know, speak, where, you, you know, the character is so slow-spoken and drawn out, where you can have a character who speaks so slowly that you have ample time to actually just decide what they're going to say next. And that's ironically one of the better ways to play a character, in my opinion, nowadays. Having someone who has to be quick and witty every time can be good, but it can also be straining on the mental effort that you're trying to put in, especially if you have a, a large roster of NPCs that the players interact with all the time. Yeah, and that's another thing. If, if you think about how people talk in real life... Um unless they've got a speech prepared or something, they don't speak concisely and completely perfectly. They have, uh, like, bridging words like um, ah, uh, stuff like that. They have uh, periods of time where they're thinking about what they're saying as well. So it's not... It's not an... Whilst this... An, an aspect of the game that is acting it's not you don't have to be a perfect actor to play absolutely and ultimately it does also come into the fact where a lot of people just aren't that good at speaking right like even with having a, a list of stuff for us to talk about it's um you know it's one of those sort of situations where you still have time to slowly kind of think over what you're saying, and that's the convenience, at least as well, of having a conversation between two people, is it gives you time to actually consider through what's actually happening. Um, now we have a question here in um, Acrylics uh, VC. How is How do you get into the forest area blocked by mountains? Uh, that would be relating to the map that you see here. Um, the mountains specifically... I'm more using them as an indicator of there are mountains here. However, when you look at them, don't um, don't just think they're just going to be flat mountains. There's going to be ways for characters to uh, climb over. Um, this is specifically a map for a um, for a very hero based campaign. So for all I know, at this particular moment, by the time they get here, they could straight up have flight. Um, there's I've just tried to have it as a indicator that there is going to be some degree of a mountain range and there probably will be ways around them um but yes um and also thank you for the follow hope you enjoy what you uh, what you're hearing but okay getting back to um creating the actual broad world as a thing it's something important to remember that at the end of the day don't don't forget that you're playing a game with people Right? And people aren't perfect, of course. There are always going to be situations where you may stumble over your words and you may, you know, have to take a moment to step back and say, okay, hold on, this is what this character says. And that's okay, because at the end of the day, it doesn't really make sense if you're playing a character who, oh yes, I, I, I know exactly what I saw and I'm 100% certain and uh, there's no changing what I saw and yep, and this and this and that and that. and It's as if he's already got things planned. And honestly, a lot of the times those sort of characters almost seem le the least trustworthy out of all of them. Yeah, if, so, if, if you think about it in real life as well, coming back to that, if there's someone who's 
perfectly driven to a certain goal and they want nothing to do with anything else but that goal, they're not someone you really want to hang around with unless you have that exact same goal. Yeah, absolutely. So, and thinking about come... from sorry. that, uh, thinking about from that, um, it's that same sort of idea. Uh, with a player character, uh, and this is getting a bit further, a uh, player character should should have a goal, um, but should be broad enough to fit with the the world and the hooks that the DM lays out. Absolutely, and at the same time, of course, that is going a bit further into actually playing as a character, but a lot of the time, your goals should be broad enough that you can work with other people to actually achieve those goals. Creating a character whose whole situation is, I must avenge my father, a very simple and very common sort of thing to find, that, however, doesn't inherently imply that he has to do it alone, or she has to do it alone, they, whatever you're playing, yes, you get the idea. Um, ultimately, it comes down to a situation where a lot of the time, working with a team can actually be the best sort of situation to work with, and ultimately that's, of course, what the, the party is for. Um, but yeah, and then, so... Going into that whole situation, um, I think the other main important thing, whilst we're on uh, the note of um, creating characters and such, um, I'll quickly pause us there and we'll finish off this subject so that way we can go down to actually talk about who you're working with. Because yeah. um, this note here should be pretty quick, but it's just simply having a map. And there are plenty of map-making tools. For example, you can simply create a map by getting a piece of paper and roughly drawing a shape. Um, a lot of my maps nowadays tend to be very geometrical, but at the same time chaotic, right? So, for example, um, I tend to build very triangular sort of areas because I find that triangles, immediately when you're looking at a triangle, you have three main points of interest, each of the corners. And then if you try and give them a bit of interesting features around the way, for example, like little jabs in and out and certain sort of areas, you can actually create something that is interesting. And that being said, don't think you need to be able to whip up something immediately visually yeah, that's, brilliant. That's um, one of the things I personally, whilst I like having a map and I quite like uh, hand-drawing maps, um, I think if you're first starting out and it's your first campaign you're writing and running um having a map of a continent or a country can be a little overwhelming um, oh absolutely um so oops, sorry, even, even if like even a physical map or a picture of a map i find myself personally i don't need a hundred percent uh that's because i'm very good at visualizing uh, locations. However, however, having, for example, a town map of the, the town you're starting in for the first couple of sessions is extremely helpful. That's true. And as someone who has honestly been on the other, the flip side of that, where for the longest time, it was about a year that I played my, uh, my hero campaign, I simply made it a corner of a continent. I basically just made a big square that just said, main city and you know had a sprinkling of trees up around the top corner and implied mountains around the right side and a bit of desert down at the bottom it was one of those sort of situations where because i was working with the with my players and i was discussing with them this is like i basically said hey this anytime you are in a location I will list out all of the stuff and we can we essentially figured out a way to play without a map entirely. We played D&D &D in a way that was entirely verbal and for a while that was interesting. However, I noticed that some of my players tended to start losing not interest but ability to focus as it got later in the night. And I came to the realization that the way to fix that is to give them something to like actually look at and be like even when their minds kind of wander 
by looking at something that can put them in place in terms of knowing where their characters are and knowing where they need to be or what they need to do, that ultimately came down and helped quite a bit. So, yeah, just, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, so I ended up actually de- like taking the small amount of map I'd made and I expanded it outwards into essentially the shape of Africa if it was um, flipped on a vertical axis, I believe. So in other words, flipped it from like, so left is right, essentially. And I just took that shape, slapped some mountains around. I was, to be fair, I even just kind of got to the point where I just basically drew a question mark over a lot of stuff and just said, hey, I I don't know what's there. I haven't figured that out yet. You know, it is what it is. We'll get there eventually. But you see this one spot that is filled in? Here, go over that way. (laughs) You need to be there. So that basically kept all the players good for the most part. And frankly, it actually ended up giving us quite a, a lot of interesting dynamic of, hey, there's still stuff down there that we don't know about. It's not an entirely charted out world despite being in a modern setting. There was still plenty of mountain and forest that I hadn't even planned out. And the, my players knew that. And because, they, because they're considerate individuals, they basically just went, okay, you haven't planned that out. Well, we're going to trust that when you do plan it out, it's going to be good. So we'll stay away from that area until then. And frankly, I appreciated that and it allowed it. So when I did have the time to actually develop that, because of course, you know, you need to have time to be able to do such things, it made it all the better, at least personally for me. And I think my players enjoyed it as well. Yeah, the the idea of maps and whether it's a full continent map or a town map or a battle map or whatever, it's really good for orientating the players. Um yeah, that's so they, absolutely true. They understand where everything is, uh, the distance between stuff, um, at least to some degree. And not only that, but I think the distance between things is an important relative measurement, right? Because in my campaign, at the, at the start, I basically said, hey, you are working for this company, and they are going to organize you a helicopter out. And they traveled the equivalent of maybe on the full continent map, maybe about three squares worth. And I said, okay, that's going to take you eight hours in a helicopter. And so the next time I said, okay, now you have to go back out there, but this time you're doing it on foot. And this time it took them four days. And then that way they had a basic staple of, all right, so if it took us this far by helicopter and it took us this far by foot, what's the wisest and and best way for us to get all the way over to this other location, conserving money and also making sure that we get there on time for whatever we need to do. And I think that's an important measurement, at least. Okay, but I do believe that then does lead us in talking about players, unless you want to have a quick moment to Um, say something. No, I was going to say that sort of uh, the extent of at least the basics in creating a wider world um, yeah. and mapping and stuff like that. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, and frankly, honestly, by the first time you run a session, you don't even need to stress about that stuff, especially if you're running a session zero, which is, uh, we'll get into what exactly that means later on. Yeah, but, and what to prepare for a session zero. Yes, absolutely. And later. So, of course, the next thing that is important is, okay, you've got a basic world. Now, the next thing you do is you say, okay, this is cool, but who's going to populate this world in terms of who are the players going to be? And personally, for me, I tend to stick with people I actually know in person. Um, There is generally something to be said about online channels describing horror situations with with D&D and role-playing games. And personally, I like to stick to people I can trust in terms of being, you know, safe and good and, you know, not going to make everything awkward for each other. Yeah, I have a couple of personal experiences with D&D horror stories of campaigns I've uh, run or played in with people from Reddit or other places like that. Yeah, uh, and... Which I can get into a bit if, 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 we, if we want. But... If we've got time at the end, but I reckon yeah. we can get into that, yeah. But um, personally, because of 
my preference of having people over the table that we can talk to and hang out with. Um, that makes it so it's difficult to do it online anyways. But that's the other thing of knowing people in person and having, you know, friends that I've actually spent time with and had time growing up with. It means it's a lot easier for me to read as a DM what they're actually thinking of a situation. Um, I can look around my table as I like prepare a situation and depending on just the body movement and the expressions that all of my players have, I can know exactly what I need to do more of and what I need to do less of. Yeah. And, and now, uh, oh, sorry, you go. On the, on the specifics of uh, who, who you want at your table, um, whilst it's true that uh, not all, all of your friends who are interested in share hobbies and other things will be interested in D D or playing or whatever. It's good to start with people you know, at least people you already have a relationship with. You can always meet more people at your local game shop or otherwise uh, for that, but um, it's good to start with who you know and who at least sh shows some interest. Yes, absolutely. And frankly, at the end of the day, I personally prefer making sure that, um, you know, there are people that we do know because meeting new people is somewhat difficult for a lot of people and understandably so, but um, having people that you already have established um, communications with makes it all the easier and likewise it makes it even easier to talk to them, which is an important thing because sometimes there are situations that do go bad and certain friends might be unbearable over the table and that's okay all things considered but it's important to be able to say and be able to have the ability to say hey this isn't working either let's can or can we stop this campaign or is it okay if i ask you to not come to the campaign anymore and this is something that honestly a lot of people have trouble with i am one of those people to some degree i've had instances in the past of certain people who if you come around to the stream quite often, you'll probably have heard me talk about them. Um, but ultimately, there have been times when I've invited people to campaigns and they've thrown off the general in the general vibe, per se, of the room. Um, you know, we've had campaigns that are supposed to be kind of light hard and everything, and people have rocked up with... Uh, Shadow the Edgehog type level characters of oh yes I'm an orphan and my family is all dead and also I'm at, I'm edgy and my power is to be edgy and that is something that for a certain style of campaign can be alright but in that particular one it wasn't and it made it so I had to sit down and say hey this isn't working let's let's analyze the situation. Let's talk to all the other players and see what is working and what isn't. And in that instance specifically, I had talked to all the other players and for what was something small and like not so bothering to me, a lot of the other players had actually expressed that they were quite upset by how it went. You know, they were enjoying the kind of upbeat, happy vibe that was going on in the campaign and they thought that it was brought down by that person, which... Um, for the sake of, you know, protecting people, I'm not going to actually mention the name, but um, I have talked about it before, regardless. Yeah, but... and I have a couple of notes on that on that front. Um, when talking to players, uh, if there's a problem, it's very important, in my opinion, to speak to everyone privately. Um, uh, so you get their story that's that's un, unedited by the people around them, unedited by themselves because of the people around them. And also on that same note, I don't think you should jump to kicking someone out. You should sit down with them and say, look, this, this isn't working. Uh, is there a possibility that you could sort of shift this behavior towards this? And Absolutely. whilst that's also very difficult to do, I find it works quite well. 
Yes, um, that's absolutely true. Um, I personally, I I did just say um, kicking them out just because of that's what ended up yeah. having to happen. But that's absolutely true. Confront them or talk to them in private. Talk to your players in private because especially, especially if you're actually not in that like position of even if you're not a dm even just trying to get the other people's opinions can be very important and the last thing you want is to you know say something in a group chat perhaps where um you know you're you'd be like hey this is a dick thing that you've done i don't like that what like and saying you know implying that you have an issue with it and then have other people turn around and go hey actually no we don't believe that. We think you were actually the one in the wrong here. And that's not a position that I think anyone really wants to be in because that would be very awkward. So that's why it's important to talk to your other players and, you know, you're, if you're not a player, your DM in private before you um, jump to any big conclusions like that. Yeah, exactly. But um... yes. Um, and then as for that that also comes into an important thing of knowing actually what type of person you're dealing with. Um, I find a lot of people fall into certain archetypes of, um, you know, player. And I'm not talking something silly like, um, oh, yes, I'm such a Sagittarius because I like to stack my dice on top of each other. Or I'm, I'm a Pisces because I get really happy when I get a critical 20 sort of thing. Like, I'm talking like you've got certain players who are the archetypical sort of, you know, you'll have people who are very, like, you know, they get startled and they are taken aback when they're called out on things. You have players who are just, who are like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't realise it was an issue and they're apologetic. You might have certain players who are stubborn and are basically just like, no, I'm sticking with what I'm doing. And you need to know who exactly you're dealing with, both in good and bad. And this is not only for, like, you know, reprimanding someone who's done something wrong or what you believe to be wrong, but in terms of hanging out and having a party in terms of your players. Um, I generally personally try and get people who are like-minded. I have um, several people who have many similarities to myself. For example, at least looking... Or at least thinking back to my hero campaign, we had several people who were all like-mindedly creative in terms of the way that they played their characters. And even still, there were some people who didn't particularly play them in the same way that I would have personally played them. But I still valued their opinion because sometimes having difference is also good. But overall, for that campaign, it was supposed to be a light-hearted campaign. And for the most part, it ended up being a light-hearted campaign. And I pretty much appreciated that. Yeah, and that... That's also not getting into the specifics of all these labels you hear of problem players, um, like rules lawyers and etc. This is just the type of people. And a, a thing to remember is, uh, usually, if it's your first game you're running or playing in, uh, the people you're playing with are your friends. So you don't you don't want problems uh, that happen with playstyles in game to be affecting out of game. Absolutely. And the other thing to remember is that. It's okay to have people who are different to you. You know, it's okay to have, if you, for example, are someone who hates druids, maybe. It's okay to have someone who plays a druid, because sometimes it's actually a good way to find out how, or certain things about druids that you didn't know about, and in fact, actually change your opinion of druids, right? There was um, There was traditionally someone who... A lot of people, or a lot of um, of the players in my campaign, traditionally said they had an issue with. But as it came closer and closer to the end of that campaign, everyone started actually starting to really appreciate how his character was built. And frankly, it was one of those situations where for quite a while I sat there and I was concerned about how exactly the build would work. But by the end of it, I felt he had built an interesting character and it was one of the situations where I kind of was able to rest easy knowing that I did trust in him as a player and him as a creative, a co-creator. And honestly, I think it, that was one of the fun parts of my campaign, being unsure as the DM of what my players would do in certain circumstances and being able to react in that way. 
and I think that that um, moves on to the next point we have of you don't you don't have to understand 100% of every little facet of the campaign you're running. It, yeah, it's it's fine to you know, miss miss little bits of information that you thought of thought up of or not have certain uh, information. Or like some of my players point out, I often uh, go to uh, descriptions of people with uh, white hair. Or... <laughs> Stark white hair, yep. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Uh, which is something that, knowing, knowing that, I uh, have started to sort of pull away from, started trying to learn different ways of saying stuff. Yeah, and absolutely. What... <laughs> and even still, like... NPCs Sorry. with white hair... But um, it's still, it's all a learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And ironically, actually, in that campaign where that was pointed out, it became actually kind of a running joke that it was stark white hair. Um, so there was a few NPCs that came in where, um, as you would be describing them, we're all sitting there, like, on the edge of our seats waiting for you to say it. <laughs> like, uh, is it gonna, it, what's the hair color? Is it, is it stark white? Is it stark white hair? It better be stark white hair. <laughs> And frankly, that was um, that's actually another point that um, isn't actually noted down on our text document. But having friends around you that you can kind of get along with does allow for stuff like that to happen, where you can have running jokes and you can have situations where you know you might not think of it at the time, but someone says something funny or they call out something, and all of a sudden, you know, it it comes and it becomes a running joke, right? Um, there was one where I had a, um, a character in, in my campaign called Caesar, who was supposed to be the NPC foil to the party to some degree. He was supposed to be in foil in terms of, you know, he is another character who is similar to them in their power level. But the whole running joke became that he always got the worst roles when I, like when I rolled for him to do stuff. So it'd be, oh man, he, here comes Caesar tripping over his own feet as he walks down towards this sort of thing. And that honestly made the character a lot more interesting rather than just having him be, you know, the equivalent of some tough, like, friend, ally thing that they have. Just being like, oh, it's bumbling Caesar. All right, here we go. And then, you know, granted the characters were maybe a bit, um, what's the word, not masochistic, but um, sadistic in some of their um, certain things that they did. But um, there was a lot of times when it was like, oh, Caesar got hurt, serves him right for being so bad you know, whatever, like yeah. all that sort of stuff. And I took it in stride. It was yeah. one of those things of it's an NPC I liked, but frankly, he served a much better purpose being the comedic relief. It's all about not being, not taking yourself as the character so seriously and also not being so set in what you believe has to happen. Oh, absolutely. Because um, that takes away a lot of the uh, randomness of the game. And it's a game based on dice rolls, which sort of defeats the purpose. Yeah, absolutely. It's important to have NPCs who aren't strictly stuck to scripts, which is something that took me a while to learn. But after a while, I stopped writing out their entire list of dialogue like a video game, uh, even though that's where I wanted to go with it, because that's you know a career that I was interested in for quite a while. Having a character who can just adapt and say oh you know you're asking me this question here's the answer here is what i can give you but as best as i can and you know reacting as a person because it's pretty easy to um once you realize that you can just put yourself in their footsteps you can kind of think on the spot of what they would do right i um i had a character who he was supposed to be like the head of the company sort of thing and a lot of the time the players would call him out on uh, on what they believed were him withholding information on the missions that they were supposed to go on. And he, at one point, just turned around and was like, guys, stop. I'm giving you all I've got. You need to chill out and stop trying to, like, be this sort of thing of trying to, like, nag at me every time. I'm giving you literally every, everything I can. And for that character, he was. He was trying to do his best. And honestly, I feel when that situation happened, it was almost a very human moment for that character because for the first time he changed his his you know outward experience outward um 
image from you know on top of everything to like hey guys i can only do so much can you like not like can you just chill out and work with me here sort of thing and i think after that the players were like oh yeah okay maybe let's step back just because he's being played by the piece like just because the character is being played by the the dm doesn't mean the character knows everything the dm knows and that's that's another thing uh it's not exactly within this point but um it's a little mention uh on a advice on how to run npcs uh they're not encyclopedias yeah absolutely Pretty there's much. there's a lot of npcs who like you know might be intentionally misleading to the players or legitimately just don't know what you think they know like just because a player is there and this is something that actually goes to humans as well like normal people um there's been many tests done showing that like you know if you witness something that your memory is gonna not properly take in the right information i believe i don't recall the specific um specific thing but i can find it and link it or something um where there's tests done of like you know I, I believe the specific way it went down was there was a university class and the lecturer went to the, a couple of students and said hey i want you to help me with a test right i want to i'm going to say this thing and i want one of you to stand up and say something along the lines of i disagree with that you are wrong and then have another person stand up and and con or encounter that by saying hey no actually you are wrong then an argument uh, breaks out. One of them pulls out a gun, and it like was one of those sort of situations where afterwards, you know, they did this little um, I wouldn't call it a skit, but their their, their little exi um, their little test basically. And afterwards, the the, uh, the lecturer came around to everyone and was like, "Okay, so this is this was planned. This was a this was something that we went over, but." Since it is something important, I want you guys to all tell me what type of weapon the person was carrying. And I believe it was something along the lines of like 85% of people couldn't identify. It was a standard handgun. They were saying stuff like it was a knife or it was a, you know, a machine gun or something like that. Like something a lot different. And it's because of the, the brain's inability to, when adrenaline starts kicking in, to fully recall everything that's happening. And that frankly honestly is one of those things that a lot of players forget is a thing there is a lot of people who in a situation of like tenseness you know for example in D, &D having maybe someone get killed they're not going to remember it perfectly and that's understandable because that's frankly just how existence that's just how the brain works but regardless that's a whole tangent on its own yeah but um, yeah yeah um and then, yeah, at the end of the day, um, for the most part, the best thing is to just relax and not stress over it. But um, I think that's another thing that is important is um, it sort of is... It's very useful to discuss with your players what exact style of campaign they actually want to run, especially when it comes to creating NPCs, because if your players want to create a... Um, or they want to play a campaign where they are as, you know, as everyone likes to call them, murder hobos, where they just kill things for the sake of killing things, you need to be aware of that and DM that appropriately, even though you might not like that. And sometimes it's important to run a one-shot as just a, hey, you guys are, like, somewhat high-level players, or characters, rather, and you are in here, do whatever you want, and just have a few sessions to just roll some dice and just beat the crap out of things and frankly that's okay it's one of those situations where um that's actually how i learned to play the game we just sat down and had one of the fr one of our friends just say hey i'll dm let's just see what happens and we end up having various campaigns where you know we had a furball being played by one of my close friends who got um got drugged and then was and then during his uh, like drugged rampage ended up on the top of a church roof and we had to climb up and try and calm him down and bring him back down and then hunt down the people who did it to him sort of thing. And it was, it was one of those sort of situations where was it a campaign where there's an elaborate story? No, there wasn't. It was just a situation where 
the DM thought it up in 10 minutes and we were sitting around having a couple of drinks and he basically just said, hey, let's play some D&D. You know, let's just beat the crap out of some goblins and some cultists and bandits and all this and that sort of thing. And it just works. Yeah, good um, uh, unwind or stress relieving game is um, not a bad thing. Uh, obviously, if you hate running that style of game, uh, then you don't want you don't run it as a full campaign, but um, you gotta let let the players have a, a session or two every every once in a while where they they just do what they want. And of course, it doesn't have to be your standard campaign that you worked so hard on. Uh, just treat it as sort of like if you treat it yourself as a as a joke campaign or a uh, this isn't gonna get go anywhere anyway, then you're not gonna be as against um, what the players are doing, if it's a murder hobo type situation. Absolutely, and frankly, that comes down to the situation of if you are running a murder hobo game for them, and they are sitting there being really wanting to play a murder hobo game, then they'll be more willing to play a proper diplomatic style or like, you know long drawn out story based game because you actually gave them something to sate their hunger for destroying things basically and frankly that's that's okay it's okay to have a session where you might not be on the most keen on it but it is what it is but then that brings us into the topic of okay now you've got the idea you've talked to your players about what sort of game they want to play how do you actually get started on running a game now, I think, Mastermind, you probably have a few differing opinions on this than I do. Um, uh, maybe. Um, as for time and date, uh, regularity, um, I like to run a game, uh, a session of a campaign, every week to every fortnight, um, on the same time. Uh, but even that, sometimes, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. Yeah, However, absolutely. In, in, in saying that, uh, in, my, in all my games, there's always the expectation that if you can't make it to a session, you let people know a day or so in advance at, at, at the latest. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so I'm sort of the same in terms of, you know, weekly to fortnightly games. And a good proper running campaign is one that you guys can communicate and work together, right? Um, in my old campaign, it basically became a known thing that we were running it on Saturday afternoon at 5 p.m. every single week. And if someone wasn't able to make it, then that's when you throw a message into the chat. That might not be a thing, but it is important to at least get a time and a date done and make sure that it is understood within the players when the campaign's going to run. Because at the end of the day, frankly, um, running a campaign and not making it regular is the best way to kill off a campaign immediately. Yeah, I... For myself, it's... I find it hardest starting of the campaign, the first two or three sessions, where you and your players decide a particular time you want um, and then the second week in, someone says, oh, I can't do this week. And then you say, okay, well, we'll skip this week, go to next week. And then someone else can't do that time. That's, yep. where, you, that's where you have to say, okay, I can make exceptions and I can, we can reorganize now for this week. But are we going to need to permanently change the date and time? Or is this going to be something that you have to deal with as a as like the player has to deal with on their own whether they have to uh, unfortunately withdraw from the campaign or have to find some other way to make it to the agreed upon session yeah absolutely and i know that there's been several sessions both um, dm'd by both of us where um there's been times when we run one session because my philosophy on that is just just say time date does it work for everyone yes and then just go for it establish a time and a date and just go and then 
the second session something comes up and then the third session something comes up and all of a sudden what was supposed to be a running long running campaign has turned into oh well we started it for a week but we played six hours and then we weren't able to play for the next three weeks so what's the point in continuing sort of thing and it's honestly really heartbreaking when that happens, but sometimes it just does, and there's not much to do about it. Our past, you know, making sure that people cut off, or they making sure that people actually like are available for that time. And if people start becoming not available for that time, either talking to them and just saying, "Hey, either you're going to have to get your stuff together, or you're going to have to withdraw." Simple as that. Yeah, especially if you're. The type of dm like i am and like i think you are to some degree of um where before session zero you put a lot of effort into creating your own world um yeah i would say past, i'm pretty accurate with that past that you can varying degrees of planning and preparation but uh for me in particular i like to have uh, a few starting settlements uh a general idea on the the politics of at least the nation you're in, um, and a few uh, potential arcs, which can take me anywhere from a, a week to a month to write up. And then if that's if that's all that all that effort, and we play for three hours, then it's almost wasted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm likewise. I'm sort of the same. Whereas I will. I try to make sure that before my first session I have a map and I have the names of different towns down and the name of the continent um, in the background, unfortunately. You'll see I haven't actually come up with um, the name of this uh, this continent yet. But before the actual session is started, I will make sure I have a name for it and I'll make sure that at the very, very least I have an idea of what the story will be about. Past that, a lot of the time, it ultimately comes down to trying to work with the players and seeing where they want to go with their characters because say for example a character um i mean even using your one that you're creating for the other campaign we're playing in a couple of days i'm at the current moment just basically wanting to see where you go with your because you're playing a druid who was a um who came from a tribe and you have to do some trials to try and be worth or to be you know i think it's considered a a proper hunter or something like that um yeah so, uh i'm thinking along the lines of yeah to be considered a fully fledged adult in that tribe um is what i'm thinking there's some trials that have to happen uh which i'll i'll fully come up with and send you uh the basic outline and then yeah. sounds good and then that. yeah and then basically the... oh sorry you go Oh, that, that was that was okay. Yeah, um, but yeah, and then basically as a DM, you know, I take that and d I have my overarching story that will be taking place over time. But as if say you're going like a Boy Scout style thing of oh, you have to earn your berry picking badge style thing. You know, you'll while we're going along, you might stop and you might find this grove of these really bright and colorful berries, but you might need to like go through and ensure that you actually learn which of them is poisonous and which of them isn't per se, you know, small stuff like that, where you have the overarching story, but a lot of the flesh and meat within the story is filled in by what the characters actually want to do per se and what want to achieve basically. Yeah. Um, and then that also kind of brings us to the other note we've got here in getting started is you need to establish with your players, and this should be something that you can do pretty easily if you are able to talk to them, establish your rules and boundaries of and expectations of what the players want, what you want, and what you're not going to do. Um, a common one personally for me, and I presume you're probably sort of in the same situation, I really can't stand, like, at least in with the boys playing a campaign together, I don't want to play a character who is sexual with them. That's just personally my preference of I don't want to d be playing as a character who they have a sexual interest in because, frankly, that's just not really what I want to be doing. Whether you are into that or not, that's fine. 
I, but... I think I have a similar but maybe slightly more relaxed. Like, I don't mind the in-character or character-to-character or character-to-NPC sort of uh, flirting or that sort of thing. But again, with explicitly sexual stuff, it's it's a you walk into the room, close the door, and then that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I'm not going to describe anything more than that. I do the, you know, the stereotypical game fade to black. You come, you rejoin the party two hours later after you've had a shower, had like a chill out and, you know, maybe a bit of a nap, you know, that sort of thing. But I'm not going to describe in detail how certain stuff like that happens because, frankly, that just isn't my interest. And... Like, I, I generally trust that most of the pl- people I play with can at least be relatively, you know, into that same box of, like, not wanting to do anything outside. Especially when it's, like, a bunch of guys all playing with um, varying levels of relationships, for example. Um, at the current moment, um, two out of the six of us uh, have partners, um, if I'm calculating that correctly, yeah, uh, those two do, yep. Um, and frankly, you know, for all guys who, I believe, just off the top of my head, there's only one of us that is, you know, I suppose LGBT is the best way to put it. Frankly, you know, he, sure, he can do whatever he wants. Actually, correction, he does actually have a partner as well, so that makes three of us. So half of our group have partners. And we all kind of are under the impression of we don't want to, you know, bring bedroom content into a hangout session with the boys. That's frankly just how it is. Um, yeah. And that that sort of um, that sort of ruling works in many other facets. Like, uh, for example, if you're someone who doesn't like extreme violence or Oh, absolutely. Uh, scenes of torture or something like that. You can say this is not happening at this game. Yeah. Uh, and... and likewise, you have to talk to your players and understand that they'll have some things that they don't want um, at the table. Uh, and then you have to work with all your players to ensure that everyone follows the couple of rules that you set up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, torture is one of the things that I will avoid talking about. Um, likewise... Something that I find is interesting is one of the best ways to demonize a villain is to make them commit, like, you know, sexual, sexually, what's the word? Um, Devious. Devious and malicious things. Uh, You can kind of imply what I'm referring to. But I avoid doing that and talking about that sort of stuff because, frankly, it's not something I'm necessarily comfortable talking about. Yeah, I sort of, I avoid that as well. It... I find that even outside of how it can make people uncomfortable, I find that uh, I like to think of other ways to make someone seem evil or uh, uh, at least antagonistic. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I, I'll avoid that sort of that sort of imagery um, in terms of other stuff like. Uh, for example, someone's instead of just that they're maybe they're extremely wealthy and they keep hiring people to uh, like a private militia to go and bully people into giving money or something like that. Other ways of making people the bad guy. Yeah, absolutely. And um, on that similar note, I um, I've just pulled up the list of rules that I have thrown in for the campaign coming on Saturday. Uh, correction sunday um and at least looking over them there's a lot of basic stuff that is more summed up to being a courteous individual um for one you know while i'm dming i don't want people sitting on their phones that's kind of rude um likewise i don't want people playing sounds on a soundboard um there was one individual who whilst we were in the preamble of creating characters would just play soundboard sounds and that immediately pretty pretty heavily ticked me off sort of thing. I'm not really into that sort of thing. Like, I get ha-ha funny joke, but of course, you know, 
there's a time and a place, and I decided that would be one of the ones that would be an explicit rule I've stated for the actual campaign. Um, however, you know, there is of course other reasons to that. You know, if you're sitting there on your phone, you miss stuff that I say, or rather, I being all DMs, if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss things, and that can really slow down a game. There is, after all, reasons why there are so many videos on YouTube about speeding up campaigns and such. Yeah, it's just um, being interested, and of course, people will have stuff on their mind because that's that's how it, that's how the world works. Um, not everyone's going to be in the perfect frame of mind to play every single week for that long. However, it's just a sign of respect, not only to the DM, but to the other players who are invested to um, at least try to be as invested as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Also, um, I've been alerted that apparently my car lights are on, so Mastermind, can you take over for a quick second while I deal with that, please? Uh, I can. Thank you. So, outside of establishing rules and expectations, um, that's almost self-explanatory in in my point of view however there are some specifics uh that you have to go over and the entire the entire thing you need is some um, communication uh between players between dms uh between just everyone outside of the context of the game as well um so i think that's probably how far i think it's probably exhausted that that line of uh, uh, speaking, um, so I'll just move on. Uh, so to refining the world, uh, uh, stuff like towns, quests, NPCs, uh, designing interesting towns. Um, I have a sort of a a way I do, I design towns is I'll always have uh, at least one shopkeep that sells general goods, uh, always have uh, one inn or tavern or something like that. Um, I'll always have uh, a, a blacksmith, uh, somewhere to get your basic goods. Um, and for slightly larger towns, I'll usually have a couple of inns. I'll have maybe a magic goods shop, uh, which can be varying levels of uh, power and price. Um, I usually have a couple of, uh, just, just town folk, uh, not specifically made out, but, um, like a list of names, a list of basic descriptions, a uh, list of words that give me ideas of, uh, particular voices or, uh, ways of acting, um these uh, NPCs uh, which is uh, moves on to NPCs as a character um, you got to think of not only their physical description but also uh, if they're important NPCs uh, what are their goals uh, what are their uh, their bonds like who who they answer to or who they uh, feel connected to. Um, it's got, uh, it's got written here, um, sort of their social situation. So are they solo? Like, if so, why? For example, um, a hunter out in the woods, he's solo because uh, it's easier to track game. For that. Yeah. Also heads um, up, I'm back. But, um, yeah, I've I've sort of uh, moved on to making NPCs. Yeah, that's uh, all good. Um, so yeah, at least what I was thinking with the whole solo thing is um, there's a lot of characters traditionally in most modern media who tend to be seen as the lone wolf, and it's important that if you're going to create a NPC that basically follows that um, sort of aspect um, that they have a reason why. You know, people yeah. don't become loners just because they feel like it a lot of the time it's because they've been pushed into being a loner because as a throw over to um, some of what you were designing when you were streaming 
a character is forced into having to hide because their their like lover's father has accused them of um, stealing goods from their family. However, it was actually gifted to them, like stuff like that, where there's a reason why characters are on their own, and it's important to observe that and and think about what that actually means for the character themselves. And then also, if they're possible uh, allies to the party, um, why would they stop being solo for the party? Um, absolutely. What and... sort of actions or uh, what level of trust do they need in the party? Yeah, and that's the other thing to consider is um, there have been many, 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 many videos made about having player characters who are solo, but... Uh they fall into the same category of why are they solo and what would make them want to ally with the actual party themselves a lot uh, of the time. That's, that's one of the rulings um, I make in my games. Uh, unless I know the player and I trust the player, uh, and even then there's certain stipulations, but I, I won't accept a character who is the lone wolf. Uh, the most I'll accept is someone who used to be a lone wolf that is now joined the party for whatever reason. Absolutely. And personally, at least for me, it's one of the situations where I much prefer to have a character who is inherently friendly because I know how drawn out and boring it can be to have to go through the whole, you know, run of, oh, well, I'm such an edgy lone wolf, convince me to join you. And the, the, the other players go, okay, no, you wear high level or wear you know, decent adventurers and have, you know, already gone through some degree of story. Why why should we try and convince you? How about you convince us of what why you should even be with us? Yeah, that's what I find a lot with players who and why I sort of ban it is players who go, Well, I'm the lone wolf, you have to convince me why I should join you. The rest of the party why 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 should they let the lone wolf join? That's that's what they're gonna think. Yeah, absolutely. And like any the... degree of intelligence from any of the party members, like out outside of game or inside a game, I'll just say, well, we don't we don't really need you. We we'll just yeah, move I mean... on to the next guy who's more cooperative. Yeah, absolutely. We've been working pretty well ourselves. Like, what does like the only thing that really changes if you have an extra person is, oh man, now we've got to split the loot against instead of just about three players, it's now through to four players that literally brings the amount that you get down by roughly about 8%, which can add up. So I think um, uh, with duos, it's it's similar to solo, uh, if, if not as, um, if only not as extreme. Yeah, I think so it's, it's... A dynamic duo will still have a similar problem of why should we join you? Um, or why should we let that dynamic duo join us? For the example. main thing, however, is that with duos, there's it's often a lot easier to rope a duo in by appealing to one of them, especially if it's a situation of if you have one of the players, then you'll have both of the players, because instead yeah, of having to appeal to two, you just appeal to one. That's what I mean. It's uh, it's similar to solo, but less extreme. Um, yeah. An example and... um, in another common media in The Last of Us 1... Um, you have Ellie, who was basically the main proponent to Ellie and Joel joining the uh, two brothers that they find in one of the cities. I would say that without Ellie, Joel probably would have um, would have probably just killed both of them. But then, likewise, of course, that goes and that brings us to talking about a group of NPCs, which is. Probably the easiest way, I think, to develop NPCs where you have a family or you have a yeah, cult or at of least, people. Even if they're not like a tightly knit group, uh, an NPC that has a lot of social connections. Um, yeah, absolutely. So it doesn't make sense that the tavern keep is like it makes sense the tavern keep's going to be on his own a lot, but it doesn't make sense that he doesn't know most of the townsfolk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of the smaller NPCs are gonna, you know, after their long day of farming or mining or whatever type of town it is, 
um, they'll come into the tavern, they'll chuck back a beer with the boys and, you know, have a good time. And in that time, of course, the tavern keeper is going to have formed a lot of knowledge and conversational time with those people. And, of course, that leads into, naturally, the tavern keeper knowing what's going on. Yeah, so a, a group doesn't necessarily have to mean an organised uh, body of people. It can mean someone who knows a lot of people, who understands a lot of the dynamic of a social, social situation. But that doesn't mean stray away from a close-knit group. Um, families can make for good uh, NPCs uh, or groups of NPCs that, you can inter that players can interact with. Um, uh, another adventuring party uh, could be, you know, either somewhat of a rival or antagonist if they if you're both going for the same goal, for example. Absolutely, and I think um, um, there's two notes I can make about that. For one, naturally, of course, um, having even a family as player characters could be very fitting. You know, if the characters inherently have that familial bond, then you get to easily bypass how do they meet how did they like why are they together it's pretty simple how did they meet well they're a family why are they together well they're a family you know all that sort of stuff yeah um, and whilst you can have more um uh in-depth uh relationships uh and dynamics with that um for example why is uh even though they're siblings why is one sibling risking so so much for this other you can have reasons for that um yeah absolutely uh, there's many with, many yeah I was, I was just gonna say there's many 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 examples in a lot of media um both anime and not of two brothers or brother and sister or two sisters that stick together and even though one of them might have a certain skill that the other doesn't they usually can complement each other quite well um, there's a show recently that I was watching called, uh, I believe it was Demon Slayer, where um, the main character, his uh, sister, becomes essentially a demon, and he has to try and protect her, and I haven't gotten too far into it, but that's basically where I'm up to, and naturally, of course, you see that brother-sister bond in play. And there's also the inverse of that. For example, uh, I wouldn't advise it on a player, cardi, uh, player character in 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 the party situation but you could have uh why do these siblings absolutely hate each other what absolutely. what has gone on in this past and frankly that's probably actually pretty easy to at least describe but at the same time you've got to be careful because if you make them seem to hate each other too much then the question becomes okay well why don't you just leave like we get you hate each other just go away and you never really want to be in a position like that because that can, you, that will immediately tear apart the party, and yeah, that can really yeah. ruin what's going on. It's something that you have to be very careful with, but it's it's possible. Absolutely, but that also brings us to talk about rival characters, um, adventuring groups. Um, I personally try and make sure that at least, at least depending on how many players I have, that I have a rival for each of them. And that doesn't inherently need to mean antagonistic or evil. It could just mean there's a couple of, you know, in the case of the campaign I was running, the hero one, a couple of other rookie heroes who are trying to make a name for themselves that happen to have powers that kind of kind of counter out um, how some of the other, or how the PCs work. So, for example... If we had a PC fire character, then I can look over to my water-based um, rival, right? Or a, if not inherently water-based, but uh, I believe specifically for the one that I built, um, because I did have a fire character, um, the water-based character was a shark uh, character. Um, With... I'm sort of, I'm almost of the opposite point of view, whereas... I don't think rivals are necessarily bad. I just tend to turn away from them because I feel like there's... I put enough 
antagonists in, or not necessarily antagonists or bad guys, but enough uh, in in the way of the characters that I don't need an active rival. And whilst That's... there may have situations come up where, for example, two different groups of people are both hunting the same animal, for example, that would be a situation I might use a proper rivalry in. Um, yeah. I don't tend to have it long-lasting. That's fair. And frankly, it it's one of those things where having a rival is optional, of course. Um, generally, the main reason I include them is because it gives a proper reason for the players to interact with uh, NPCs, which for quite a while during my campaign was actually a difficult situation, um, with Caesar being kind of shunned to some degree and the, the main person who was in charge being somewhat distrusted despite him trying his hardest it ultimately came down to the players didn't really have any reason to talk to npcs most of the stuff they could achieve was generally you know self-built like if if they were looking for a um for someone who had you know been a villain or something they would go out on their own or working together as player characters to solve the sit solve where they are and because of the fact that they had superpowers, it kind of made sense in a lot of circumstances that that is what would happen. They wouldn't need to necessarily interact with NPCs, especially or especially ones that um, aren't, you know, or are there as rivals. But at the end of the day, it is one of those sort of situations where you can do it if you want, if you feel it's not necessary, that's entirely cool too. I just yeah. think it's a good way to have a bit of a dynamic, especially when I make them kind of, you know, uh, kind of zap back with um, with a bit of a uh, bit of spice per se. You know, if um, my I feel my characters are kind of traditionally not harsh, but uh, very kind of we are the Stop. best. Like we are clearly the best ones here, sort of thing, and they uh, they were able to kind of not necessarily knock it out of them but kind of be like hey yeah no clearly you're not there are certain things that we can do that you guys can't and then you know flex with their powers in sh like show off a bit of um a bit of you know zest per se uh and then kenny's coming in with the it's a mechanical and narrative tool if wanted oftentimes it's not personal though it can be a professional rivalry can just be can be just as useful for agm absolutely um I mean, even looking yeah. at traditional media, like, or not even media, but games as well. Think about how many games have a rival character. Literally, like, every one of the Pokemon games, like, there's always rivals. And that's that also brings us on to also sidekicks, which, depending on the campaign, can be a thing that can, you can use. At the same time, it can also be something that's completely excluded. In a hero-based campaign, it sort of makes sense that you include some degree of sidekick, but uh, only on, when it on, makes sense. On that point of sidekicks, it's sidekicks uh, seems very specific to hero campaigns, but that also includes stuff like um, uh, hireable underlings, squires, stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, another note on the rival thing: um, in a in a game like Pokemon, the rival system is somewhat gives somewhat what gives you agency to beat the gyms um at least in a story point of view uh for D, &D uh whilst there are occasions where i might use it it's not a dynamic i'm particularly uh i don't particularly like it too much that's um, fair I'm, i don't dislike it but it's not something i uh work with very often yeah, and I think that might have been more so just because of the context of the story that I was working on, of having, like, it It was one of those sort of stories where, off the bat, the players are given the, given the mantra of, this is the story of how you guys become the best, and having rivals is a good way to kind of challenge them and make them fight for that title, I think. Yeah, that's that's the similar the similar agency to why the Pokemon games use rivals. Um, you're both trying to be the best, or in in your case, both 
both parties are trying to be the best. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's that's why I sort of shy away from it because it seems like it's only to further a specific goal rather than uh, what I like, which is more of a uh, I like running at least more of a, a story driven uh, character arc type game rather than everyone's going for the same goal. Yeah, that's, that's, fair. that's my personal um, preference. So. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, but that being said, okay, so you have created right. a map, you have got your people together, you have set a time and a date, you have created your towns, you've set up some basic quests, some quest lines, you've got a handful of NPCs prepared, you've got, you might have rivals, you might not, depending on what you want. Now, what do you actually do for getting a campaign started? Well, a common thing that a lot of YouTubers do note on uh, is having what is known as a session zero. And that, at least, I would describe as a session where you immediately are setting up, you're doing a lot of meta work, so making sure that everyone has their characters together, you make sure that everyone has their, um, their character motivations, and you, depending on how much time you want to spend on it, set up making sure that characters have backstories and the character party is together. I would say by the end of a session zero, having the party together and having characters set up is at least the two main points that I try and hit on. Yeah, I, I somewhat agree. Uh, I also try with uh, session zeros. Uh, um, like, I'll have session zero, the, the main bulk of it would be to uh, either help the players finish up building their character, um, give them some ideas on character plot, stuff like that. I'm usually a bit uh, relaxed um, uh, with full backstory. I'll, I'll ask that people have a general uh, uh, backstory they have and a goal they want to achieve, but specific details, um, I'll leave it till it develops more naturally. Um, Included in a, in my session zeros though is I like to have at least a small, uh, almost like a prologue of actual play. Um, uh, for example, in the pirate campaign that I just started, uh, we had the session zero of everyone making their characters, and then I had about an hour and a half of a prologue written. That's fair, but and was... that allows the world to be properly yeah. given to the players, so that way they are filled in on small bits of detail they might not know about, um, especially if you're playing something like um, traditional modules, um, like Lost Minds of Fendelva, um, the uh, Dragon Horde, I don't recall the exact name for it off the top of my head, um, like all those style of uh, campaigns, Heist, uh, that's the one. Um, Curse of Strahd. Uh, yeah, it's good to fill in the players on stuff that they they might not know, but the characters themselves would know. So, for example, the the Zentarim, um, the um, oh, what's the name of it? There's a an alliance of like paladins, I believe, is one of them. As you might imagine, personally, I don't play those books, so it's not very on top of my mind. But personally, it's something where I'll I use some of those bits and pieces, and I might integrate them in. But say, for example, in my campaign. My first, uh, my first session was essentially real play of first um, their first combat encounter, learning how their quirks work, um, learning how you know the hero system works. So you know the more the more villains you beat, the higher tier hero you become, and essentially setting themselves up on um, on all of that sort of situation. Um, and the other thing that I would say is this, as a session zero, it's good to run one of those situations, especially if you're a new a new DM, because you get a feel you get a feel of how to make calls in terms of um, rulings for certain combat things that you might do. So, for example, um, if a character casts a spell and you're unsure on it, you kind of start getting into that mindset of, okay, well, for the sake of the story, having to continue, I'm going to say that this thing happens or you know we don't know the exact ruling on it we can address it later on 
but at the current moment i'm going to say that say this uh, say the level one spell sleep you might be unaware of how that particularly works you might think that it's every character underneath the health that you roll gets put asleep and if you are unaware of that and you aren't sure how to interpret it you might just say okay well i'm just going to call it that and we can come back and we can address that later on but this is what i'm going to say for now yeah and like, uh, oh, go ahead I was going to say, likewise, also, the other important thing is knowing and figuring out when to call for certain ability checks to be made is another important thing, though that um, that kind of comes with playing the game, and you'll pick up that yeah. as you go along. Um, with, uh, and this we'll get into this a bit a bit more when we go over how to play as a player, but um, uh, as a DM, choosing what ability checks to make uh, and when to make them it is very relaxed. You pretty much, when the character say they want to do something, you can either just decide that, that that it happens, or you can say make this check. And the and unless it's extremely outlandish, what check you choose, most of the time it's up to your discretion. Yeah, absolutely. And the other important thing that um, you can note is that whilst, say, for example. Um, medicine might be traditionally uh, i believe medicine is traditionally an intelligence uh, based check i think you can't... I thought it was wisdom isn't it uh well regardless um regardless one way or another you can also call for say a wisdom based intelligent uh, a wisdom based medicine check or you know maybe a, a strength based sleight of hand check or something along uh, those lines a that common is possible. one a common one i see is for example uh maybe a a large brutish barbarian wants to make an intimidation check, but because their charisma is not that high, they would fail it. But their intimidation is them being physically uh, present and physically threatening. So then a common call is to say, well, instead of charisma, you can make intimidation based on your strength. Yeah, absolutely. Or perhaps uh, another similar sort of situation might be if there's a very intelligent wizard that um, they might be able to use something like an intelligence uh, uh, an intelligence persuasion check based on what they're actually knowing rather than trying to just say what they're trying to say. So that also comes down to specifically the DM's discretion, and that's an important thing yeah, to remember. Which, that's a bit more advanced for beginners, but um, pretty much skill checks. The DM chooses when they're relevant. That's, yeah, absolutely. That's the sort of basics. The other thing to note is that you don't actually have to... You can you don't have to say it and set it in stone. You could always just say, hey, okay, you guys want to try and run or get over to this location. I'll give you the choice. Roll athletics or acrobatics sort of thing, which is a, a very common one to go between you might have dexterity based characters who are using their ability to be nimble to jump over things whereas you might just have someone who is really like physically fit who can just charge their way through ultimately that comes down to dm's discretion on if you want to make that call and i find a lot of the time that most players are going to either have strength or dexterity one way or another because dexterity is such a useful skill for having ac having your initiative all that sort of stuff, whereas strength for a lot of the time is attack rolls for, you know, basic weapons, all of that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. uh, one, I think, uh, final point on session zero, if we're ready to move on from that. Yep. Um, I, uh, another point on having a prologue session. Uh, I have run session zeros where we didn't do a prologue session. Uh, but it seems to be, uh, it just seems to be not not that fun. So it's, without a prologue session, it seems like everyone's coming together, hanging out, doing some maths, and then going home. Yeah, it With, sets a scene, basically. You know, that, that, that's fine if you, if you like maths, but usually if you're coming together to play D&D, &D, you want to play. That's just sort of yeah it, it's like it it's like if um you know you play for a couple of weeks and then someone's away for two weeks and they come back again 
it's one of those sort of situations where they're going to be completely lost within the world to some degree, but even more so because they are they're missing out on that session zero experience. Um, that being said, session zero can also be useful to clear over certain bits and pieces that might have been necessary to bring up. Um, Kenny says also that session zero is a good time to discuss all homebrew rules, removal of all things that you don't want talked about, and knowing what every player wants from your game and what all the characters' motivations will be and what they're willing to to do to achieve them. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we touched on uh, all but homebrew rules, I think, a bit earlier when we were coming to what you what uh, getting getting ready, what you expect. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but homebrew rules. Uh, I'd suggest if you're new to the game, to not worry about homebrew, homebrew, um, too much. Uh, it can sort of muddy up play. Uh, however, for more experienced, homebrew is something you can definitely uh, look into. Um, it's Absolutely. just about learning how to balance it. Well. Yeah, um, it's a similar situation with um, if you're ballsy enough, which personally I prefer to refrain from, but using something like Unearthed Arcana, where it is playtest content, where personally, because of I like the fact that we have an in, uh, ingrained sort of balance already, I don't like using it, but I know, uh, Mastermind, I believe you use um, Unearthed Arcana quite often. Um... Uh, not not unearthed arcana as it is because unearthed arcana as it is is way too overpowered. Um, oh, okay, fair. I'll like for example, I started using artificer before it came out in in Eberron. Um, uh, so that was something I sort of tweaked a bit, and actually I didn't get it too far off what it eventually became, which I was quite happy with, but still. I think mine was still slightly more powerful than what it eventually became. That's true. Um, so I also... the end of... oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, at the end of the day, it's okay to have it be a little bit too overpowered or a little bit underpowered because as a DM with homebrew, you can always um, talk to your players and tweak certain things as you go along. It's not necessarily a situation where you have to stick entirely to what the homebrew thing that you're using says because that's the whole point of it it's homebrew it's brewed at home with the your group essentially um and yeah, also... I, have, I have a couple of uh small homebrew rules which i think uh might muddy it up for muddy up the understanding for new players so i won't get into it too much but i do run with some uh relatively basic and not not too strange homebrew rules um, but I also homebrew a lot of uh, monsters and a lot of items and stuff because I find uh, my players are a little too eager to look up things. Yeah, I um, as being one of those people who has played in your campaigns in the past, that is certainly true. I um, I know quite a few people who, um, you know, as soon as you mention, oh yes, it's a sword that from the blade spews flame, I can think of at least three people who would immediately go, oh, that's flame tongue, instead of letting you finish what you're saying. Yeah. Um, and but, so yeah. I find that uh, when when the players come across a, um, for example, a, a goblin that can suddenly fly and cast spells, they are uh, a little confused yeah that's definitely true um especially when you have certain people i know we're probably going to both think of the same person who is very law oriented in terms of who or in terms of what can do what um that and also i'll yeah. quickly bring in the comment that kenny also just said which i think is very important um if you want to control your players successfully while having it feel organic rather than railroading them um then you need to also understand what they want to play and what their characters want to do, which is extremely, I also, well, I agree with it, it's extremely important because that's, the session zero was also the time in my campaign where I established, hey, guys, this is pro, it's going to be an open world game, you can play open world, however, a lot of the time, I will be giving you tasks to do, and you will know what you have to do. I'll make it very obvious, you know, you get a call from your boss, you know, you have you like i'll direct you uh, into like you know oh as you guys wake up 
you know, you look around, you know, that um, Wolfgang has gone for a quick jog, you know, Canium's probably out playing Dance Dance Re- Revolution, and as the clock ticks over on to 8 o'clock, your, your phones all light up with your alarms telling you to get ready to go to school or university in my circumstance. Um, and then I already established that ahead of time with my players, and that way it could be somewhat railroady, but they all knew that it was going to happen. And frankly, I think that made it impo- like that made it very, you know, good because we all were on the same page and we're all working with the same details. But yes, and then so okay, uh, unless we have any following notes to add on to the session zero details. Uh, I, um, I think I've I've got um, everything I wanted to touch on that. Fair. Um, then I suppose the next main thing, and this is where I stopped writing notes on, uh, or uh, this is where I like lessened how much I'd written out as we um, prepared for the stream. But uh, we're going into following sessions, and I'll quickly also just throw in what Kenny has just sent. Yeah. Uh, people have locked in preconceptions of fantasy content. Anything non-standard often causes a lot of confusion. But this confusion is not always a bad thing. Not only do players get to see something new, anyone that wants to try and metagame will easily get counted. That is absolutely yeah, that's, true. That's what I was saying with a lot of my homebrew monsters in particular, uh, because that's where I, I particularly find uh, problems um, with where uh, we'd finish a session with a monster that um, the players are just introduced to yeah like a dragon uh, with three heads for example uh i'm more talking about the end of a session uh as a cliffhanger they see this monster um and then that's the end of the session that's then true. next session despite the characters having never seen something they understand certain things about it that uh um they should oh, uh, which yes. is why i did stuff like uh for example, you brought up the three-headed dragon, yep. which I'll use that as, as an example. It was essentially an ancient red dragon. However, however, it had been uh, touched by the fire flame further and distorted by uh, primordial energies. So it had grown three heads. It had also grown an aura of fire, if I remember correctly. Um, so basically, if you're within 20 feet of it, at the start of your turn, you took fire damage. I um, hang on. I, I don't think the aura of fire was a thing, but um, I get at least. I mean, I might not remember it because I ended up inside of the dragon at one point. But what I will say is, though, there is a certain thing to be said of leaving it on cliffhangers because that does also inherently give players time to plan and prepare, which may or may not fit depending on how much time you have. For example, if you're directly into a situation of like oh crap oh like crap now we're fighting sort of thing um it may or may not be the best thing um because i know for one thing i'm definitely someone who would think about the campaign through the week i remember when you introduced that three-headed dragon i like immediately was like oh crap what am i gonna do like looking through my list of spells as my wizard ah oh, crap um I've got time stop here. Uh, okay, I've got uh, this item in my bag. Uh, if I teleport in to its stomach, it should hopefully be big enough. And I will drop a, like a, what was it, a pearl of like a fireball or something. Actually, no, it might not have been because that would have been dumb. Um, oh, that's right, it was the poison. We had some really yeah. powerful poison, and I remember I, I teleported in, like a time stop, teleport in, drop the poison, and... I believe I attempted to teleport out, though I think I failed. Or I, yeah, but regardless, like in that time of the week of downtime, it gave me enough time to pretty much um, have a situation of an entire like mind map of what my intentions were in the next session. Whereas in game, we would have had ten seconds to formulate something. In- uh, with with that sort of situation, I don't mind players going between sessions uh, on a cliffhanger and saying, "Okay, this is this is the strategy we're going to use to defeat it. Um, this is we're going to do this, this, and this." But when they come back and start knowing, for example, it has resistance to psychic damage or something like that, that's that's the trouble I have. 
I don't That's mind true. strategizing because okay. I think it, I think it ultimately ultimately makes for a more fun experience. But um, that's uh, fair. With understanding the mechanics of how the creature works, that's where I uh, am a bit annoyed. Or more so, understanding how the creature works without it making logical sense. Yeah. Um, I'll also throw in what Kenny has said here. You can even do simple tweaks and keep them internally consistent as players have not encountered them in that setting. For example, Troll's regeneration speed is doubled on any round that they take magical fire or acid damage. Um, trolls are now susceptible to cold and sound damage, doing two times as much and slowing a troll's regeneration by half for 1d4 turns, or, or rounds, correction. Um, it turns into stuff players can only learn either through study or by experience. That's fair. Um, and that's one of those sort of situations where I can imagine with trolls as well, um, trolls traditionally, if I'm not mistaken, are susceptible to fire damage, I believe. So flipping it on, on its head and saying, okay, instead of being susceptible, you actually get punished because you are metagaming by trying to... Like, if you don't actually know what in-game they're weak to but out of game you're using or you know they're weak to fire and you're immediately going for fire based attacks um oh they just don't regen under fire damage okay that's fair um but yeah naturally of course at the end of the day um it's one of the sort of situations where it's important oh, oh okay i can't hear you is uh can you wait are you able to say something Wait, hang on. Um, yeah, um, just the doorbell went, so I muted for a bit. Okay, yeah, because my headset also was like, hey, can you please charge so you don't destroy the battery? Um, so my headset might be a bit running out. Um, so if my audio quality drops for a half second, we have to take a quick second to um, fix that up, then heads up. But um, yeah, okay, that's fair. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, you don't want characters to be metagaming because then that kind of ruins it to um for the character's experience and it can be fun to have your characters themselves experiment with different attacks and find out what they actually do but um yeah so that's the thing um and then of course that i think brings us into the following session so okay you've had your session zero you've got a map set up and you're starting to get confident um and now the question is okay what do you prepare so Personally, the way I do it is I prepare by making sure that for each session I have rough notes on what should be going down. However, at the same time, I leave it open to the players and I basically say ahead of time, hey, I do have some content prepared for in this area, but if you wish to head somewhere else, I'm not going to stop you. And that can be good and that can be bad, depending on what you're really doing. Um, if, I'm, if I'm running a campaign that's a lot more directed and controlled, I usually prepare a few more notes of, like, these are the characters that you'll be facing, this is what's, you know, this is who exactly will be coming in and doing this and doing that and the types of villains you'll fight and all that. But that's just personally me. I accidentally clicked on another Discord call. That's all good. Um, my headset um, is kind of freaking out, so um, I'll tell you what. Let me quickly go into uh, unless set. unless you want to. Um, uh, if we finish up doing the DM, um, bit, then we can do a separate one for a player if you want, so we can get more information on that rather than what we just have. That sounds yeah. I think that's probably a good call. Um, so yeah, heads up if my audio, if the audio, I think for Mastermind drops halfway through the conversation, I'll fix it if that happens. But I think right. yeah, we wrap up the like podcasty style episode in quotations with DM stuff. That puts us at about two hours, so that should be good. Yeah. Um, and then next time we do this, we can properly have a list of stuff to keep in mind as a player. But okay, so let's get into it. Um. So I think the important question is, that's at least what I do for preparing for a session, but I presume you have quite a few more notes than I do for each of your sessions. Uh, I don't have 
uh, session notes, for ex per se. Like they're not okay. This session we're doing this, this, and this. Uh, that's not. That, I know that is a way some people like to prepare. I see the benefits in that, but I feel that's way too linear, way too restricting for my my play style. Um, what I do instead is I go, okay, this is a quest line. Uh, this is a start of a quest line in this place. Uh, this is here. This is another start of a quest line in this other place. This is here. This links to here. Now, if the players go, oh, I'll have a look at that, and then go along that quest line, that's already uh, has a framework written out. Um, so I have lots of frameworks for lots of things, but very little that's in-depth. Uh, most of the stuff I have in depth uh, are particular characters. Um, for example, uh, in my Strahd game, uh, I had a... Uh, for maybe four or five months before the players actually got to it, I had this um, drow settlement and a uh, the particular drow sovereign um, uh, planned out... Uh, exactly his personality, what I, how I wanted to play him, stuff like that. So if it's very important to the story I'm trying to tell, uh, then I'll flesh it out fully. Otherwise, I like uh, um, more loose frameworks. And yes, I, I also agree uh, that I probably, uh, to what I agree to what Kenny's saying, that I probably make more notes than I need, um, especially if I'm going into... The, yeah. The Wait, hang on. Sorry, I apologies if I'm speaking over you. It's because my uh, headset keeps going off. But um, yeah, the uh, I I think for most DMs, it's a pretty common thing to make way too many notes. But um, that's not necessarily a bad thing either. Having more is always better than having less. I've been caught out many times with uh, having not enough notes, and just improvising. And frankly. Honestly, that comes back to the whole thing that we were discussing at the start of it's okay to be bad, it's okay to have to improvise. At the end of the day, it's one of those sort of situations where sometimes that's just, you know, how it goes. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either. Yeah, I think... Um, so, what what's important to prepare for each session is... Yeah, so heads up, I've also... Oh, hang on. Oh, what was going on there? Never mind, hold on. Wait, hang on. Hold on for half a second. I just realised that... Um... Me plugging in my headset has apparently sent you through a different audio thing, so give me a quick second to quickly fix that, and we should be good. I think we lost what we were just saying. Okay, wait, try now. Hello? Okay, I can't hear you at all. Uh, <laughs> crap, hold on. Hold real tight for half a second. Let me change my input here. Um, and let me go to my Bluetooth. Apologies for horrible audio. Do, do, do. Over here, connect. Come on, soundbar, don't let me down. Uh, you heard that just now? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Okay, now say something. Uh, Stream has been able to hear me. Um, okay, so... Okay, we can hear you now. Okay. So let me quickly just turn down that so it doesn't have echo, unfortunately, and turn you up, so that should be good. Alright, okay. is this better? You um, can hear me on, as well? Okay, wait, say something. Hello? Okay, that should be right. Alright, cool. Alright, so hiccup, apologies but... for if you're watching that and uh, all of the jank that just occurred, but... We'll be right. Okay. All right. So the I was just going uh, saying about uh, what's important to prepare. Uh, the general area you're in, if it's a town or if it's a dungeon or something, uh, what you're likely to encounter in that 
area, even if it's just a random table. Um, what you a, a sort of goal that you wish to achieve, or the players wish to achieve, and ways of furthering that, if not completing it. Um, uh, and sort of just ease, ease of uh, quality of life stuff, like random name tables if you're in a city, or uh, the, like a thing I mentioned earlier, the, the uh, earlier on my stream, um, the DM screen has a lot of useful stuff on it, even if you don't want to uh, just get the information written down on something like a DM screen. Um, uh, so it's on, on hand, uh, so you can not have to think about it too much. Yeah, the thing is, the DM screen is something that most people, like, you don't need to use it, but I remember for quite a while, uh, Mastermind, you had an Assassin's Creed DM screen or, like, you know, folder thing that you would use to um, hide all of the stuff that you had there. But I would go so far as to say that you probably don't need, like, while it's good to have, I wouldn't call it, necessary but at the same time it definitely helps um and kenny says that all gms have the gumption and time you think um all gms that have the, the gumption and time you think should take notes on names and anything really and keep them in a document for personal use it's not it's too useful rather than having to wing it that is true though in certain circumstances you might not have the time but having at least a simple like document of names can be really useful just to note down, okay, I've had to use this name for this thing. Yeah, for example, um, I'll have maybe the characters need to uh, find a random NPC. Um, so I'll have uh, basic notes written down for generic stuff I could just pick from to create an NPC on the fly. Then if the interaction goes in a way where I uh, think that the players might interact with this character again, I'll write down the information I have on it um, that I've come up with. Uh, sort of creating an NPC as we're playing that might be, uh, that I think might be uh, visited again. Yeah, and the thing is, it's one of the sort of situations where ultimately it does come down to being very useful that you can do improvisation and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's been a lot of situations where... Um, I've had to create characters on the fly because I just didn't expect that, you know, nameless NPC here who makes a comment that the PCs are going to turn around and go, oh, well, what's your name? What's your life story? And I have to sit there being like, oh, um, uh, oh, yes, I grew up down in the south. I'm just a humble farmer or I'm a humble whatever. And I'm just, I just happened to be here to see what happened and went down. Don't worry about it. Please stop talking to me and don't ask me my name. <laughs> But, um, yeah, it's one of the sort of situations where um, having the notes and the ability to take notes is very useful, though it also depends on how much time you have to prepare. Um, luckily, I've... Excuse the, uh, the... Every vehicle driving past my house right now, apparently, wanting to rev their engine. But, yeah, um, that's why I'm preparing my... any All of the sessions that I think I might run through the semester, because university student, blah, 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 I'm preparing them now because... On the on the off chance we even do play these games, or at least the one I've for the map I've got on the background currently, um, I want to have at least a lot down so it eases the the weight of when I am creating it in the future. But yeah, um, and then as Kenny says, one simply can't cover everything, but the more one covers, the easier things tend to be. Uh, backstories can often be avoided, as asking strangers for their backstories is often ask, like asking people around you for their theme song. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those sort of things of, like, you know, not everyone knows that their theme song is, like, thanks for the memories or whatever. <laughs> but um, you get the idea. It's one of the sort of situations where um, having at least rough descriptions of people can be useful, so, you know, in case you say, oh, yes, nameless NPC here says this thing, or you know, whatever, or they, or another example is, you know, if, um, my players, since it was a more modern setting, they, um, they had the tendency to be like, oh, we need disguises, okay, let's go over to the theatre or something, or, like, 
a theatrical shot and they would go in and I'd just say, oh, um, as the door ring or as the door, like little chime rings as you enter, um, the woman at the counter looks up at you with her kind of loosely fitted glasses and kind of furrowed brow. And she goes, I reckon you guys probably need a costume. And then all of my players say something witty of, yeah, well, no shit, we're in a costume shop, aren't we? Um, but, you know, and then they start going, like, because immediately I'm starting describing them, they presume that, uh, you know, they have a name to refer to. And at that point, having names is useful to be able to throw at them and be like, oh, yes, this is this character, etc. Um, I had one point where my characters walked into a, like, a, a supernatural, like, watchers meeting in one of my towns to try and find out some information about some, uh, some things that have been going down. And immediately on the spot, I had to create up, up like five or six or seven different characters to make sure that I at least had a roster of people for them to talk to in that one room. Um, and then as Kenny says, for characters that you think will never be in combat, one or two sentences of info is enough. A name is also very good to have, definitely. Uh, mechanically, you should only really include their best skills and what their bonus might be. If only, uh, only if one is going into combat, um, then all the stats would really be normally worth it. Uh, while you can spend that time on being on more important things. And welcome back, Yuri. It's uh, been a couple of days. How's it been? Um, we're quickly just uh, doing a bit of a D and D podcasty style thing. But I think yes. um, with that styles of leveling up, we don't have to touch much on because it's uh, fairly simple as it is and usually you don't have to worry about it first session or first couple of sessions um however there are a couple uh, the two most popular are of course xp leveling um which is it's generally a lot noted of... in the monster manuals or first stuff that you yeah. tend to fight, and you can use that as a good example of what amount of XP you should be gaining per combat. Yeah, whilst I don't think XP is a bad system, it's not a system I personally prefer, because if you're just getting XP from killing monsters, what's the incentive to do anything else as a player, not as a character? Yeah, um, granted there is uh, quite a few videos on YouTube on, you know, giving experience for, you know... For other things like checks and etc. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um. And that can be good, but the thing is, it's very tricky to work around. And, for example, with yeah. my hero campaign, there was quite a bit of time where we used experience as, like, a... You gain experience for doing certain things, and then you can spend that experience whenever you want on certain level-ups. So, for example, they had essentially the D &D equivalent of multi-classing and they could just say oh yeah i've got five thousand experience it's going to cost me three point five thousand to level up this thing so i'm just going to level that up whenever i'm ready um and yeah so kenny says that when he uh when he did the rehaul on the whole d20 system he had to completely fix the experience leveling npcs in your world level two and most of them don't do any combat yeah absolutely it doesn't make sense to some degree for um you know, certain individuals to be level one if they're hunters or like, you know, even traders, I would say, travel around and experience a lot of things and are probably the equivalent of like level threes or maybe fours, even maybe up to fives, depending on how much they get out there per se. Yeah, which brings to, uh, uh, sort of touches on the idea of my preferred style of leveling, which is uh, milestone based. So... Rather than taking in these specific experience points, it takes in the account that you've done X, you've achieved this, uh, you've managed to discuss a way through to resolve this in a non-combat way, etc., and you're still rewarded for that playstyle. Yeah, absolutely. Which and is something frankly, I quite prefer. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just yeah, going to say ahead. Milestone is generally, personally in my opinion, much better than experience based leveling up milestone even it's almost an instinctual thing of like you know after a session at like level two you might be like oh you guys did enough combat i think you guys are worth leveling up to level three and then maybe as the arcs start get longer and uh, start to get longer and longer and more in depth then it's like oh okay now it feels like it's an appropriate time for you to level up from level 12 to level 13 sort of thing 
Yeah, that that also gives the DM a lot more control over how long the game. Uh, XP I like as much as milestone, only only after you reworked it. Um, see, that's uh, that's one of the things. Uh, if I'm playing the fifth edition rule set, uh, I don't want to have to rewrite the rules. Um, so to the point where I like it, uh, which is why I have m more of a problem with that XP system. Um, yeah. If it was an XP system uh, where you know you got XP for completing skill checks or for completing a social encounter, um, then I'd be more fine with it. But yeah, it's it is too combat oriented. Um, yeah, and thing is. It's also important to remember that whilst combat is a decent part of D&D, there is quite a lot of other things that are very important to keep, you know, on top of to some degree. And frankly, I mean, there's, a, there's an entire stat for charisma. Make sure you actually have certain circumstances where you use it. That being said, yeah. it depends on really what sort of campaign you want to play. That being so said, I think anyways, that's, that's probably... I was going to say, that's probably, um, you reckon we missed anything? Um, I think we got it we all. touched um, on most of the points. Yeah, I reckon we should be good. Um, I'm going to have to, well, I suggest, yeah, we should wrap up the streamy or the, the, the podcasty style section. Um, so, yes, um, thanks for listening, if you are listening. At the end of the day, I'll probably fix this and make sure the audio sounds good and everything and upload it to YouTube. So, yes, um, thanks Mastermind for coming on. Um, no you, you can find Mastermind at Mastermind, I believe it's Mastermind72727. Uh, on Twitch. Twitch. Yep. And likewise. Or the Mastermind727 on YouTube. Yep. And likewise, you can find me uh, basically here on this Twitch channel, um, just at JetX100. And if you're watching this on YouTube, then. Well, congratulations for sticking around for, for so long. Um, at the current moment, um, yeah, I, I stream at about 6 p.m. Australian time. Uh, tonight's probably going to be a bit shorter of a stream, but um, yeah, uh, thanks for coming around. I, I'm thinking I want to try and make this into a more common thing of having conversational style, like podcasty sort of situations, maybe once a week or something. But the youtube channel should actually start being filled with you know some of the other stream type stuff i do that being said thanks for listening and i'll catch you guys later